from over at the Information School. She's an assistant professor. Uh, this is her book that came out last fall with MIT Press, Documenting Aftermath, which we're going to hear about today. Uh, she has a PhD from the Berkeley School of Information, and she was a postdoc at Microsoft Research. And I know a lot of our graduate students are interested in that particular postdoc program, so here's one on campus that you could potentially, <laughs> you know, kindly, politely ask to. Yeah, to happy to talk about, about it. Such opportunities. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I know that a lot of our grad students have taken classes with Megan before and are very interested in her work. So, this is a really nice way for us to uh, hear in a more formal setting some of the things that Megan is doing. So, with that, thanks. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for hosting me, and thank you for being inside on a beautiful afternoon for your last colloquium of the year. So, congrats to everybody for making it through. Um, Yes, as Katie said, I'm an assistant professor over in the information school. Please get in touch if you want to talk about anything, um, especially since we're a small group today and I know some of you very well. Um, I just please feel free to interrupt me at any point during my talk if you have questions about um, about what I'm saying or uh, want more information. I can talk endlessly about stuff in my book, so happy to elaborate in anywhere that you're interested. Um, okay. So if your community had been hit by an earthquake, a strong storm, or another disaster, afterwards, you would probably look to secure your own safety and those of the, um, those of the people around you. And then after you were sure that everybody around you was safe, um, you would look to figure out what had happened and tell other people, importantly, how you were doing. And the institutions that we think of as being associated with this today, so. Um, we would probably look to things like Facebook um, to let people know that we're okay. We'd maybe call them. Um, we might look on television or online and hope that officials from FEMA or Washington State um, Emergency Response Team or other local responders, um, that they would be available to help us um, make sense of what's happened and figure out how to be safe. Um, but what would happen if many of these institutions and technologies weren't in place? So today, I'm going to talk about how people communicated and shared information in a number of historical earthquakes um, in the Bay Area. So there's a couple of questions that motivate my thinking in this space and are really sort of driving the book project. So the first is, what kind of information orders existed after earthquakes in the past, and how did they shape disaster experiences? And importantly, I'm asking this in a comparative situation. So I'm saying, what about what kinds of changes in technologies shape uh, changes in people's experiences with disasters? And understanding how information orders facilitate possibilities for knowledge um, really has consequences for many people, not only for the survivors of earthquake, but also for aid organizations and researchers like myself. Um, and then the other question that I address in the book, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit less today, is what happens when information infrastructures and information orders are injured or even destroyed? And this question is particularly interesting to ask with information orders in disasters, because disasters are these weird situations where paradoxically, people are, there's an intense interest in making use of information infrastructures, in making use of information because people are trying to figure out what happened, right? But they're also um, often injured or being challenged in other ways. Um, and so in order to address these questions, I'm gonna just have sort of four stops on our tour today in thinking about this. So um, we're gonna look at the 1868 Hayward Fault earthquake. Um, so the Hayward Fault, so this is a map of the Bay Area, um, and this, these shake maps, the areas that shake the most intensely are in red, and the areas that shake less intensely are in yellow. Um, so you can see sort of San Francisco is that point coming up in the middle, this is the Bay Area, and on the east side runs the Hayward Fault. Um, and then we'll go to the 1906 earthquake, which occurred off the coast of San Francisco. And lastly, the um, 89 Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, so San Francisco is sort of at the top of that map, uh, and the Loma Prieta earthquake occurs further south. And then we'll talk about today um, in the information infrastructure that is in place today. 
Um, I hope that by examining the past, we can make the present, you know, some of the stories will sound very familiar um, and some will sound quite unfamiliar and it helps us sort of reconsider and reimagine what's possible today. Okay, so on October 21st, 1868, a large earthquake um, happened on the Hayward Fault uh, on the East Bay of San Francisco. And it was, the, it was very sparsely populated at this point. So Alameda County, which is the county that covers the East Bay, only had 25,000 residents. And so these small towns along the Hayward Fault um, experienced quite a bit of damage as a result of this earthquake. And within San Francisco, there was also quite a bit of damage. And San Francisco is much more populated at this point. I think it had about 150,000 re residents. But most of the damage in San Francisco at this point was on what was called made ground, which is man-made land landfill. Um, and in the midst of this earthquake, we see these letters like this. My dear mother, you will have heard all about our great earthquake, the exaggerated reports and the succeeding reports making light of the whole affair. But a few words about it direct from one who experienced it may have a peculiar interest. Today is Sunday. The earthquake occurred last Wednesday at five minutes to eight. I was just finishing breakfast and folding my napkin when the house, a two-story double house, was shaken as if by a giant. The walls swayed, the timber creaked and groaned. You can sort of get the point. So what is William Henry Knight, the author of this lovely letter to his mother, talking about? Um, what are these exaggerated reports he's referring to? And what are these efforts at downplaying what happened? So first, let's talk about the exaggerated reports. So immediately after the earthquake, there were many, many telegrams sent back east. And some of them, some of the first ones had reports about damage that were very vague. And some later reports said it was like about a million dollars worth of damage. And then we have this group of elite San Franciscans who are members of the Chamber of Commerce who literally gather in the back of a bank to put together a telegram that's going to tell the correct story of what happened. And this telegram effectively says, don't worry about it. The damage was not that bad. It was all on made ground to shoddily made buildings. And the damage estimate, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't exceed $300,000. And so these damage estimates are obviously sort of ridiculous to make in the, in, you know, the same day as an earthquake, right? How are you to know the value um, of what's happened? Um, but there are these important ways of communicating effectively, like how bad, how bad was this? Um, so they send this estimate out east, um, and it lands in certain places, and other places call it like an affront to rational thinking, um, and sort of disparage these estimates and say, oh, no, no, it's the figure is much, much higher. You know, it's at least a million dollars. Um, so these are sort of the effective, uh, the, the efforts at downplaying the earthquake. And why would they want to downplay this earthquake? So, San Francisco at this point is home of all of the industries in California. And California's industries at this point are primarily extractive, right? It's taking stuff out of the ground, um, it's farming, um, and timber to a certain degree. So, so California is built on these extractive industries built in the ground that you ideally want to be like reliable, right? Like you don't want your ground shaking if you're work working on pulling stuff out of it. So they want to put together this whole narrative that says, it's not that bad. Your money's safe with us. Laborers, come out this way. <laughs> you know, keep working out here. Um, so they put together this, this narrative that really downplays the earthquake. Meanwhile, we have um, people who say take pictures and make postcards, like the picture in the upper right is by uh, Edward Moybridge, and it became a postcard. Um, and these are also postcards. Um, this is the top of a letterhead. Um, so you have other folks who are saying, well, you know, the sensation, you know, let's sort of sensationalize this. Let's take pictures of the worst damage. Um, we're going to try to actually make some money off of this thing. People seem really interested in the story, right? So on one hand, you have these huge efforts to downplay it. On the other hand, you have efforts um, to exaggerate it in order to, like, sell newspapers. So this is a newspaper. Uh, the Daily Morning Chronicle, which is owned by um, or started by these sort of infamous De Young brothers who were like teenagers when they started it. Um, and at this point, um, people still are sending newspapers in the mail as a way of like updating friends and family. 
And so they, this Daily Morning Chronicle prints this illustrated edition that's for friends back east, right? It's for people to send to their friends back east. Um, and so you have this sort of like variety of ways of sort of trying to tell the story. And of course, people like William Henry Knight have to come in amidst all of these reports to try to like give his version of what happened. But of course, it's being sent through the mail because at this point, the telegraph is really too expensive for common people to use. OK, um, so the earthquake public in San Francisco was treated to these like exaggerated stories, these downplaying stories. But they really advocated for more information about what was happening and actually sort of wanted a more authoritative report to tell them, how do I build safely here, right? Um, so as far away as Chicago, people started looking forward to this report from a group of learned men in San Francisco. And essentially, that was referring to the California Academy of Sciences. And so this is a group that had been putting out um, papers about earthquakes in the proceedings for the California Academy of Sciences. Um, but sort of seismic knowledge in California at this point um, is not you know, the, the sort of like um, preeminent place to study earthquakes that it is today. At this point, you know, very little of the sort of global knowledge on science, si seismicity from a scientific standpoint resides in California. It's mostly in Japan and, and Europe at this point. Um, so they're putting out these reports in the proceedings you know, uh, Berkeley as a university is, uh, you know, sort of getting started right now in 1868 and 1869. So there aren't a lot of professional scientists in the area, but this sort of group of, of learned men is supposed to put together this report. And they get together and they have some meetings and they start putting evidence together and think about putting this report. Meanwhile, the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, which is the very group that put forth the telegra telegram trying to really downplay the earthquake damage, puts together this earthquake committee. And this earthquake committee also endeavors to produce a report. And that effort ends up sort of swallowing the effort of the California Academy of Sciences. And you know, the, this Chamber of Commerce reasons that um, while earthquakes are definitely bad for business, understanding them is actually also quite good for business, right? Like they want to actually be able to build buildings that aren't going to fall down. Um, however, this report never gets produced and circulated in the ways that people expect it to. And there's been a lot of um, debate and discussion within the history of ge um, geology community about whether the report was produced and suppressed or whether it was under, like, sort of deliberately underfunded. Um, the author, one of the authors of the report died in the process of putting it together and like nobody could locate his papers. So there's sort of lots of questions as to why this never got produced, but it, it did never get produced. Um, so people basically never got the sort of authoritative account of what had happened that they were really searching for. So I wanna step back at this point and just talk about some concepts that I have been using so far in the talk and give a little bit more um, backbone to uh, what, I'm, what I'm using. So I've been talking a lot about public information infrastructures and I'm drawing um, very much on work coming out of STS and to a certain degree information studies from people like Lee Starr and Jeff Bowker and Paul Edwards um, to talk about public information infrastructures. Um, and they say, you know, infrastructure is relational, um, that people, depending on um, their sort of positionality with the information infrastructure, might experience it as pervasive enabling resources in the networked form that are mostly invisible to them, or it might be their everyday work practice. And for these scholars, infrastructures are importantly these really heterogeneous entities, um, including institutions, practices, um, and also the sort of material parts of it, um, tubes and wires and computers and things like that that we tend to typically associate with infrastructures. Um, public information infrastructures both embody politics and produce the kind of politics. Um, so, and some scholars will take this a step further and say as sort of complex socio-technical assemblages that, um, that infrastructures are also ideological vessels that confer meaning, meaning upon the societies that produce them. So this is work of like Brian Larkin, for example. And he says, you know, functioning infrastructures are these symbols that society is modern, that society is progressive. Um, and, you know, as 
history, STS, anthro, um, geography scholars have noted, infrastructures are not only symbolic of modernity, but they're crucial for ordering it and stabilizing it as well. Um, so for all of these reasons, the sort of stability of public information infrastructures in these moments of disaster is particularly interesting for me. And some of these accounts that I looked at, um, you know, there's, there's real genuine anxiety and angst when things don't work. So for an example, in 1868, there's moments when the telegraphic infrastructure breaks and stops working and people assume the worst. You know, San Francisco has fallen to the ground. Um, we can't get a hold of them. Uh, you know, hundreds of people have probably died, right? Um, so these infrastructures are this sort of also these sources for interpreting what happened, right? They circulate news, they, they're, they're the sites of circulation and production of information and also sources for interpreting what's happened. Okay, and so I think of, um, you know, we have sort of multiple public information infrastructures supporting different earthquake publics. Um, that are articulated together in, in information orders. And information order is a term that I borrow from Chris Bailey, who's a historian who uses it to talk about systems for surveillance and control in colonial India. And, um, and he's really thinking of it as a heuristic, and he makes this really interesting argument, which is basically, if we talk about um, societies having like an economic order or a political order, doesn't it also make sense to talk about them having meaningfully having an information order? And that information order um, overlaps with the political order and overlaps with the economic order, uh, but is importantly different from them. Um, so I'm borrowing that term from Chris Bailey. And then, you know, of course, this is a comm department, so there's lots of conversations about what publics are, how they're constituted. Um, I draw pretty heavily from like Nortimeris and the American pragmatist tradition. Um, who formulates this conception of material publics. And I find this really particularly helpful because um, it sort of dovetails well with ideas around information infrastructures as these sort of socio-material objects. Um, all right. All right, so, um, so these are the concepts that I'm trying to work with throughout the book. I developed this idea of event epistemology as a way of considering how um, information orders and disasters co-construct possibilities for knowing in these particular event moments. So I'm trying to make this, trying to come up with this account for how event epistemologies are produced after disasters, when things are broken, when things have been shaken after these earthquakes. So early in the morning on April 18th, 1906, there was a major earthquake off the coast of California. And that earthquake actually broke water mains within San Francisco so that when people started cooking breakfast in the morning um, or sort of other small fires that had been started as a result of the earthquake um, started burning, there was no water with which to fight, fight them. Um, so a fire burned through San Francisco over four days it burned the entire downtown of San Francisco, it burned Chinatown, and it burned south of Market, which is where most of the laborers at the time lived. Um, San Francisco's population at the time was about 450,000 people, and almost half of those people were displaced. Um, their homes burned to the ground. Um, and so it raises these really dramatic questions of, um, for, and again, sort of turning this from an informational perspective, of how did people account for each other when their friends, their employers, their family, everybody had been dispersed really, really quickly um, and without notice. Um, so Sarah Phillips writes to her husband, who's in upstate New York at the time, I went directly to the Western Union office, which was a wreck. However, there were hundreds ahead of us, and we worked our way through the debris to the desk. When I saw the pile of telegrams waiting to be sent and was told, that the wires were down, I left the office at Pine and Montgomery and went to the post place at Montgomery, at Montgomery Market. The office was dreadfully wrecked, but one machine was ticking away, so I left my message. When the fire swept all the way, I thought that the possi- I, sorry, I forgot that the bike was on this jacket. <laughs> sorry. Um, let's see. When the fire swept all the way, I thought that possibly all the messages were destroyed. The next day, I sent a message by Western Union. A young man who was going to Hayward's took them to send them. 
And Sarah and, Phil, um, Sarah and her husband George go on to exchange these letters with each other where George is saying, God, I was so worried. I wanted to hear you. And Sarah is saying, I know, I know, I know. I went to you know, every single Western Union office. I tried to send things in the mail. She eventually says, oh, well, you know, the post office is accepting mail on all kinds of peculiar materials. Um, so the post office immediately after the earthquake essentially says, we'll send mail for free. Um, to people in San Francisco. So they accept mail on any you know, type of paper that people can locate. Um, and so she's um, desperately trying to find her friends in, for friends that are in San Francisco as well. So she starts walking through the city and she tells these really heartbreaking stories of you know, uh, mothers looking for their children and um, sort of this familiar Im imagery for us now that signs you know, dotting fences of people who are looking for their loved ones um, as she's walking through the city. And eventually, in you know, some of one of the later letters, she tells George, I'm trying to find my friend Lizzie Gleason, and I'm going to start going to check registration bureaus. And this really interesting um, sort of uh, complex network of registration bureaus emerges after the earthquake, which includes um, for example, newspapers are running registrations. Um, fraternal organizations are saying, hey, register with us. Newspapers as far away as New York are saying, hey, make sure you, you know, go register. Um, go register sort of as a generic term after the earthquake so that people can find you. And eventually these efforts seem to consolidate and there's kind of like a couple of um, branch registries in the East Bay and out near refugee camps and they get consolidated in a central location, and um, I'm sure this number is wildly inaccurate, but at least one estimate of how many records they had was 35,000, which is incredible, and they were getting as many as 3,000 new records a day, according to this one newspaper article. And the way registration worked was that if you had survived the earthquake and had been displaced, you would go to the registration bureau and you'd say, hey, you know, my name is Megan, I used to live at this address, and you can now find me here. So that if Katie wanted to come find me, she'd go to the registration bureau and say, hey, I'm looking for Megan. She used to live here. And they'd pull up you know, my thing and say, oh, well, you can now find her at this address. Um, so registration bureaus emerged as a sort of interesting way for people to account for each other. But a lot of um, people also importantly advertised in personals in newspapers. And I don't need to, again, telecommunications this part when people of this, but newspapers in San Francisco at the time were absolutely central to the public sphere. They occupied the fanciest buildings in downtown San Francisco. They were owned by the wealthiest families. And they were central to the way you know, interpersonal connection happened after the earthquake, not just in terms of telling the narrative of what happened. So you see people advertising, this is J.A. Pierce of Salinas, California, desires information of her brother, Jack, Natras, who was last heard from at uh, 775 Mission Street in San Francisco. Um, so people are using all of these different really interesting means of trying to find each other. Um, however, there are sort of interesting ways in which um, people were not accounted for as well. So, Um, so when we look at how people counted the dead after the earthquake, we can sort of see that there were um, ways in which these accountings very much did not work. And, you know, this sort of infrastructures as these ongoing socio-technical processes um, were really good about circulating, you know, information about certain people's welfare who were impacted by the earthquake. Um, but you know, it sort of failed when it came to this problem of counting the dead. Um, so immediately after the earthquake, um, there were efforts that started up to um, account for the dead and newspapers were publishing lists of uh, the names of the deceased in the papers. Um, Admiral, Admiral Greeley, um, who's a general, um, when he came out to San Francisco, he was on the East Coast at the time, but he was formally stationed in San Francisco. When he finally made it out to San Francisco, he right away requested that uh, hospital, cemeteries, coroners um, come forth and, and essentially give him records um, so that he could come up with a list of the, the names of people who died. And you know, the next day in the papers, you see this like Greeley's death roll um, in many of the major newspapers. Um, and so Greeley, in his final reports, estimates 
Um, somewhere around 500 people in San Francisco died and another 150 or so outside of the city. Um, other reports generated, so there was this sort of progressive um, committee that was in charge of distributing funds, re relief and recovery funds, and they had a committee on statistics. And the committee on statistics also attempted to come up with a report of how many people had died, and they ended up estimating, I think, around um, 700 um, people um, who died. Um, but it was very inexact and sort of unclear how they had come up with this number. And so in about 40 years later, or 50 years later, um, Gladys Hansen, who is an archivist for the public library in San Francisco, who's sort of one of my like informational heroes of, of my book. Um, so Gladys Hansen looks at this number and she says, this does not look right. Um, anecdotal report said, that you know, these really overpopulated tenements for working class San Franciscans south of market, um, they were on liquid like, ground that was um, uh, liquefaction ground, so they would have sunk. And then the fires that burned through would have incinerated everything, because these were really hot fires that burned for days and days on a time, at a time. Um, so she says, you know, knowing that, um, also the fact that Chinatown was filled with um, very uh, poor quality buildings and also very overpopulated. Um, and because of racism at the time, it is unlikely that anybody, um, at least in the sort of English speaking part of um, this uh, information order, attempted to, to count the number of DC's Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans living in San Francisco at the time. So she says, all of this, you know, it doesn't really sound right. So she starts this amazing effort where she first goes through all of the newspapers um, and actually tries to pull out all the names of people who are listed as dead. And then she starts going through files from courts, um, from land records, from coroner's office, hospitals, um, and cemeteries. And she ends up being able to name, all these years later, she's able to name, I think, 900, um, almost 1,000 people um, who died. And again, she says, you know, I'm only able to come up with like 22 names of Chinese Americans and six names of Japanese Americans, which seemed very, very low. Um, so she reasoned that, and, and folks who lived in this tenement housing, these laborers, were often itinerant workers. Um, they were poor, and their families, for example, wouldn't have had money to you know, call a news, uh, alert a newspaper that their relative was missing, for example. So she says there's probably, because of class reasons, um, because of racism, there's probably lots and lots of people missing from this list. So she ended up estimating that it was probably closer to two or 3,000 people who died during the earthquake. So while the disaster did mean that many reports and accounts of the disaster were produced, a system of finding others was developed, system of registering people, receiving benefits, um, which I didn't get to talk about, was designed and executed. This has all the sort of trappings of this reflexive modern society. Um, the dead were not systematically recognized. And Drew Gilpin Faust, in her book, um, This Republic of Suffering, talks about the sort of massive organizational efforts that were undertaken after the Civil War in order to name and bury the dead. Um, it, ma it makes it clear that it, you know, um, it required a lot of institutional effort. Um, and so you know, one can sort of reason that it was possible at this time but that counting and naming the dead was simply not an activity that the military, that the local government, or any of the relief organizations wanted to undertake. Um, the information order that produces event, event epistemology has also made it nearly impossible to count all of the dead people even today. Okay, so um, when Loma Prieta earthquake struck on October 17th, 1989, San Jose University students in an introductory mass media and culture class were working on individual media consumption diaries. The students were asked to self-report um, what uh, media they were making use of over a five-day period, and many students were doing this media diary when the earthquake hit, which is, um, and somebody was doing their dissertation research on this and kind enough to publish their data um, so that I could look at it many, many years later. Um, so one media diary said 
She said, after I was sure I was okay, and so were my neighbors, so this is like, there's tons and tons of research to support that this is what people do after disasters. They make sure they're okay. They check on their, the people around them. I ran upstairs to find our battery-operated radio. No one in our apartment complex had one but me. She says, I can't wait to hear what's up. We have no electricity, but thank God we do have this battery-operated radio. And as one of the only people in her ap apartment complex to have this, the student said she updated her neighbors as the news rolled in, and she headed to bed really emotionally drained. But when the electricity was res restored the next day, she was ex eager to turn on the television and anxious to see with her own eyes what had happened. And she was shocked to see the effects of the earthquake and said, Jesus, quakes look like it did a lot of damage. Um, so the reports on the most severe and somewhat exaggerated damage quickly became a challenge as phone calls from friends and family started rolling in. Phone call from parents in LA, mother-in-law in New York, friends from Hawaii and Modesto. I tried to calm everyone, but it's too late. The media really scared my family. My husband and I were scared too. Eventually, two days after the earthquake, the student began to feel burned out and listening to TV for so many hours. She bought a copy of the San Francisco Chronicle, the most important newspaper at this time, expecting more accurate and measured coverage, but was greeted by bloody pictures everywhere. It looks like the whole city was up in flames. Um, so this is the San Francisco Chronicle the day after the earthquake, and that is a wildly inaccurate headline. Um, hundreds of people did not die, fortunately. Um, uh, somewhere in the order of 60 people uh, died, and most of them, the people who died, died on this freeway in Oakland, which collapsed, the top layer of the freeway collapsed onto the bottom layer of the freeway. Um, this earthquake happened during a World Series baseball game between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's, um, which importantly meant that many, many people in the Bay Area were home watching television and not commuting home from work. Um, which was lucky in some sense. Um, it also meant that the national media was in San Francisco at the time, which really ends up shaping the types of stories that get told, get told and the audiences that they're told for. In the course of the story that I'm telling, the 89 earthquake is particularly important because there are a number of sort of anticipatory technologies that have been put in place in the form of state bureaucratic disaster response plans. And from an information perspective, the um, sort of imaginary that's articulated in these response plans is that you're gonna have the, um, the government who is going to collect the information, um, they're going to give it to the media, which is this like unproblematic conduit to the public, which is then gonna learn what's going on. And of course, this is not how things work at all. Um, so the media, not surprisingly, follows its own nose. You know, they're looking for the story that they want to tell. They're looking for an interesting story that appeals to their audience. Um, the government envisioned that their public information officers on a local level would be like on the ground collecting data and compiling it into reports that they would share with county officials and the county officials would share with the regional officials, the regional officials would share with the state officials and they would come out with this very nice and sort of complete report about what was going on. And of course, local officials were very, very, very busy working on what was directly in front of them, not writing reports for people who are far, farther away. Um, Furthermore, the plans did not anticipate that the people working for the government, the emergency managers themselves, would be learning about what happened from the media. And this actually had real consequences. So in Santa Cruz, for example, we saw in the media diaries, um, some of these people say, oh my God, this damage is awful. So that was also what emergency managers in Santa Cruz were seeing. And so um, though the earthquake damage was actually in some ways greatest in Santa Cruz County, emergency managers there were watching the television and thinking, my God, San Francisco is ruined. They were only seeing these images of the collapsed viaduct in Oakland, um, the sort of burning of the marina, which is a very wealthy area of San Francisco. Um, and the um, sort of broken Bay, Bay Bridge, which is the image that's really stuck in my mind for whatever reason. Um, so those were the images that they were greeted with and they thought, my God, San Francisco is ruined. We're on our own down here in Santa Cruz. Like no one's coming to help us. Um, and at the same time, we see 
that alternative public information infrastructures are constituted through Spanish language media to make sense of what happened immediately after the earthquake. So we had the media focused on these stories happening in San Francisco and Oakland. Um, and uh, meanwhile, the Spanish language media is actually starting to tell a very different story. So close to the earthquake epicenter is this town called Watsonville, and Watsonville is heavily populated with um, uh, farm workers, and it's over 60% Latinx population. And so Spanish language media is actually getting these calls from people talking about what they're experiencing, and they're sort of able to very quickly hone in on the fact that some of the worst damage is in this Watsonville area. Um, so, these, so there's this um, interesting alternative public information infrastructure that's constituted through the media, but also through forms and other um, types of documentation um, that are involved in getting aid after the earthquake. So in the absence of having these forums available in multiple languages, uh, community-based organizations in towns like Wat Watsonville, so there's this really wonderful story of a community-based organization called Salud para la Gente, who um, works to translate these forums into Spanish. Um, they set up a clinic and an information booth at the central Watsonville Plaza. They offer translation services um, for helping people understand building tags. So all the buildings that are injured are tagged red, yellow, green, based on how safe they are for people to enter. Um, so they help people understand these building tags. Um, and when people are moved out of temporary shelters, and they're eligible to apply for FEMA assistance, um, they help work with them on these forms to get assistance. Um, but language wasn't the only factor causing difficulty for Latinx and other residents of the Bay Area to gain access to FEMA aid. Um, the multi-generational families or having multiple families living under one roof made it really hard because it didn't fit in the model of a household that FEMA assumed. And so the kinds of proof of residency records that people needed in order to gain access to aid for things like um, rental assistance, for example, um, were unavailable. So some of these earthquake publics were really excluded from the formal disaster response apparatus that was set up by the state for linguistic and also because of culture and class related reasons. And these alternative public information infrastructures really support these overlapping groups in generating knowledge about the earthquake. Okay, so today I have these two images of the cover of the National Incident Management System and uh, a phone, of course. Um, and so I try to articulate what I'm calling like this document dialectic. And on one hand, we have today an enormous state response apparatus in place. And though the idea of who is included in the public is broader than it was in 1989, um, the state still envisions itself as being a producer of like an authoritative voice of what happened, like a very sort of singular narrative establishing what happened. Um, and this is very different than social media, which has a much more multivocal approach, right? Where anybody can say, um, give their narrative, give their description of what they believed happened. Um, but these overlap in very interesting ways. So if we look at the disaster response plans today as these ways of accessing how the state imagines things are gonna work, and you know, they're prescriptive, but they're obviously not deterministic. Um, the most sort of interesting document to start with, I think, is the National Incident Management System. And the National Incident Management System is, describes an organizational structure that is supposed to be replicated in every single disaster, regardless of the disaster size and regardless of the type of disaster. Um, and it comes out of California wildfire fighting in the 1970s. And they had this problem where people would show up to a wildfire and there would be different roles depending on what agency you're in. Um, and people might use different names to describe their job. Um, and so NIMS is supposed to sort of help do away with this by having this really, really kind of flexible organizational structure that can expand and contract depending on the size of the disaster. But every single agency and organization, whether it's city and county of San Francisco, emergency management, or FEMA, 
um, knows what the sort of roles and responsibilities are associated with responding. And they have these different sort of modules that you can plug in as well. So if it involves hazardous materials, for example, um, you would use one of their um, uh, sort of uh, annexes, and that would be this annex that put in uh, a sort of an auxiliary um, organizational structure. But again, everybody sort of knows what this is in advance and how it's supposed to be organized. Um, and from an informational standpoint, it articulates a really interesting system that's called the Joint Information System um, that ideally is supposed to generate these authoritative public information reports. Um, the other sort of interesting, um, interesting development in the last, say, 10 to 15 years is this idea of situational awareness. And situational awareness comes out of aviation psychology in the 1960s. Um, but has been drawn into the disaster response play space. And it's meant to describe um, a sort of state of knowledge where you understand what is going on. You have all of these information sources to understand what is going on. And then the sort of ideal scenario, um, you're sort of this decision maker who's in a room who has to decide where to deploy resources, for example. And you have great situational awareness, which gives you the sort of knowledge in order to make these decisions well. Um, so situational awareness is sort of this interesting term that's deployed in, say, like the post-Katrina reports. Um, some of the federal reports are like, oh, we didn't make the best decisions because we didn't have good situational awareness at the time, right? Um, so it's this sort of interesting idea. And it's also interesting because it's this way in which um, sort of in the 89 earthquake, we might say there's this very one-way model where people imagine the government informing the public. Um, situational awareness reverses that in some sense and allows the public a more active role in informing the state as to what's happening. So the state sort of envisions itself like hoovering up all of this information to form this idea of situational awareness with which they can make decisions. Um, but obviously, um, the sort of growth of this um, amazing state apparatus has to contend with these interesting logics um, in social media platforms and other privately owned um, communication, telecommunication companies. Um, so one example of um, how social media companies are starting to think of their role in disaster response is something like Facebook's safety check and so I argue that Facebook's safety check constitutes what uh, Tarleton Gillespie calls a calculated public. Um, so it essentially walks through its social graph. You know, if, if there's an, uh, some kind of event that they deem um, worthy, and this is also controversial, is like what counts as a disaster for Facebook is kind of interesting, and they've actually outsourced that now to a third-party company. Um, so you know, should they deem something worthy as a disaster, they um, activate safety check, and then they use this algorithm to walk through their graph to decide who they think might be um, affected by this or might know somebody affected by that, and then they ask them, hey, are you okay, right? So there's sort of interesting logics based, baked, in, um, baked into these, these entities like safety check. And then Facebook also allows you to fundraise after a disaster has happened, and then they take a tiny percentage of whatever you make. Um, so there's sort of these interesting ways in which um, you see these private social media companies are both um, sort of supplying information in some sense to the state, right? Like there's this infrastructure for the state to figure out what's going on in the public. Um, and the state, of course, is using um, social media platforms to put their own stories, their own narratives out of what's happened, right? In some sense, this is like the really direct conduit that they imagine, they once imagined the media would be. Um, so they can, you know, put their press conference directly onto YouTube um, without having to worry about how, you know, somebody's going to interpret it. Um, but then also these social media companies start to envision, are starting to envision themselves as having a real role in disaster response. And of course, this is like very concerning from a public welfare standpoint. Um, last year during the Paradise Fires, uh, Verizon throttled the CAL FIRES, um, the CAL FIRES uh, data plans um, and then uh, upsold them services after they had blocked them. 
And then when California state legislatures decided to try to pass some laws to prevent this from happening, Verizon lobbied against it. So there's like real reasons to be concerned about the private ownership of uh, platforms today and, and the sort of backbone for communication. Okay, so stepping back, I've run through all of these different cases that I've been thinking with and returning to these original questions I asked. So what are these information orders after um, disasters and these historical moments and how do things change? Um, and I sort of have three ways I wanna get at these questions. So first is around this question of information practices. Um, so hopefully by giving these first person accounts of how people experienced earthquakes and particularly their information and communication experiences around the earthquakes, um, I gave you a sense that this idea of maintaining status with your loved ones, right, this sort of status maintenance work that we all do, is not an entirely new phenomenon. I think a lot of um, press, particularly in the sort of late aughts, was like, no, nobody's ever done this before. Um, and of course, that's not true. And it's actually pretty remarkable to look at the amazing workarounds that people have to undertake, be it to send a letter, to send a telegram, to make a phone call, and to use social media, these like amazing workarounds that people go through to update people about what's going on. Um, and then we can look at this from the perspective of materiality of technology. And of course, um, the materiality, while you know, the sort of practice of notifying somebody is quite similar, the materiality of the technology in which we're doing it with and the affordances of these um, vast infrastructures is quite, quite different. And so one thing that's um, sort of easy to see through all of these narratives is that in these more, in the historical earthquakes, you often see people have to work to correct a narrative that's already out there. So it's not that people are finding out about a disaster in you know, slower times in 1868, right? If you were in Boston, there might be a telegram that came to Boston that said, hey, there's been an earthquake. But the idea that you could tell your version of the story of what happened and that your version would have to contend with an existing narrative does seem quite different right now where we have um, everybody's notification to mom might actually come out much quicker than a well-reasoned you know, journalistic account of what happened. Um, and then we can look at this question of institutional arrangements. Um, so while money and power, of course, remain important in all of the information orders, the site of production of informational authority really shifts over time. Um, and so if we look at the example of 1868, you really have people looking for an authoritative account of what happened and not finding one. Whereas in 1989, there's this vast sort of production of a post-disaster report that apparatus is really in place. Um, and, and the state sees itself as very much responsible for giving an authoritative account at what happened. So if we only look at the sort of much celebrated changes in communication and information technologies, we really miss this important rise of the government as a major force in shaping disaster response. Um, but as I noted earlier, we have to be concerned with this when the state apparatus adopt capitalist logics of these platform companies. So though the impulse to like call mom after a major earthquake has not changed, the ability for private companies to potentially collate all the contacts with mom and use them to summarize the effects of an earthquake, for example, has really important implications for the constellation of institutions involved in disaster response and how they imagine a disaster has happened and then decide to deploy aid. So disaster informatics really has to account for these shifts in event epistemologies that are related to the affordances of these new material technologies, but also these shifts in institutional actors and the activities that they undertake. So thank you guys so much for listening. Hopefully we have plenty of time for questions. Thanks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Can you introduce, since we're a small group, can you just introduce yourself yeah, too? Yeah, I'm Kyle. Uh, Great. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, I think like the after action report is probably only interesting to like people like me who are disaster studies type researchers. Um, however, there's lots and lots of evidence that social media, for example, that um, institutional accounts get the most retweets, um, and that that that's actually changed over the last like 10 years is that they are now like the most sort of popular um, tweets are from professional disaster response organizations. You so said, you, mean, you mean like uh, when you said institutional accounts just now, did you mean like institutional like Twitter accounts or the... Yeah, like, sorry, I should have been clear. No, like professional disaster, yeah, like professional disaster responders, yeah. but not tweeting, um, the, you know, these lengthy reports about what happened, but they're um, immediate tweets after the disaster saying like this is what happened, this is what to do to be safe, please don't go here. Um, those are sort of the most widely shared tweets. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess I was tagging on yeah. a little bit because one of the things that really struck me is, is that each population are still combating like bombastic yeah. <laughs> like exaggeration yeah. problems that are occurring. Like, yeah. 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 I'm glad that struck it stuck out to you. And it's sort of interesting to consider the different ways in which the upplaying or the downplaying happens. So in 89 because there's now so in you know during the cold war we see the passage of like the stafford act which is this act that allows um allows the federal government to respond to emergencies um, and sort of easily spend money um, so it sort of creates this very different set of incentives for calling something an emergency for that sort of like ontological designation this is a disaster um, because there's all these possible resources that come with it, whereas like in 1868, people didn't know, um, you know, sort of scientifically where earthquakes came from. This hypothesis that circulated was like, you know, it's gas escaping from the earth, or it's God, or um, uh, earthquake weather was like a really popular, and w one can sort of see if you were moving from the East Coast, and most adverse sort of natural phenomena might be preceded by like humidity or warm front and cold front or something like that. Um, you know, it stand to reason that you're like, oh, well, maybe it was earth. You know, people would write about earthquake weather. Um, so you sort of see in these different moments, there's like really different logics around like how you're going to talk about the disaster and whether um, you're going to want to downplay it in order to say, you know, again, your investments are safe here or hey, we need you federal government to throw all of your resources at us to help us rebuild. Um, yeah. I, I think you're, you're partially answering my last question. I just wanted to go so far. Thank yeah. you so much for the question. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, you talk about NIMS and uh, yeah. FIT. All the levels of government have to adopt this. So that's a like, uh, federal mandated policy that even like the counties, they have to accept this. I'm assuming now because of what you just said for federal money, is that correct? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, that's actually a good question, is like what kind of mechanisms there are in place to ensure that, because it, it is, so California is kind of interesting because the state emergency management system actually predates NIMS um, because California had sort of developed this innovative system through the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, so I, I actually know, I, I know a lot less about, say, how Washington State has responded to having to do NIMS, which might be a very different dynamic where there's had to be a uh, much more like character stick type approach to getting people to adopt these particular. I wonder if it's the parks and recreation. I can actually answer that. Oh, yeah, please. I'm yeah. actually writing the disaster preparedness for the Virgin Islands. Cool. Oh. Yeah. 
Right, like all the hazard mitigation work. Yeah. Citizens are now doing disaster preparedness available because in the event of this 9.0 that we can't even get to Pacific Northwest, <laughs> we are counting, especially here in the Grand Island, that help is not going to run for another month. So yeah. we need to be able to have a disaster station. So there's a real grassroots citizen activist um, organization that are starting to uh, spring up in all the cities. And they actually all. And CERT is, a, I, CERT is huge. The community emergency response teams. And so they do like local trainings and yeah. Right, but the very important thing to understand is that at the federal state level, they have to mess communities up. Yeah. And all the plans do have to mess up. It's not a matter of you have to do this, but we want to do this. We need to take those because that's how we get our support. If, the, if, if in the event of a major disaster, there's no one that wants to stay on their own. Sure. So a lot of the purpose of these events are to prepare people for the disaster. Yeah. 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 after a major disaster. And what's another interesting thing to know about the history of how and why LA grew was because of the disaster in San Francisco. Yeah. A lot of people migrated away because the recovery That's right. was just non-existent at that point. Yeah. So LA, yeah, LA benefited hugely right. from the That's 1906 right. earthquake. Yeah. A lot of yeah. cities benefit from disaster stories. Well, not necessarily. Yeah. Chicago. Yeah. The fires. So yeah, yeah, thank you. Take care. Good questions. Yeah. But this, but so, to be frantic, there's an exercise called Cascadia Rising. Yeah, so yeah. You do an AAR. And if you just Google AAR after action report for Cascadia Rising, there's a lot of things that you can see and kind of get some insight on what's going on at the state and federal level in terms of how they're planning for, to respond to these exercises. So they can say there's like a one in two chance in the next 50 years that we're going to have a 9 point in this. Region. Yeah. So how do we prepare the best that we can to minimize the damage, minimize the number of deaths, um, and then to understand all, you know, to understand what's happening at that level informs us at the neighborhood level on what we can do and what we should do to, to prepare. Yeah. So. Well, I'm glad to hear that these reports get, yeah, get wide reading. <laughs> they're yeah, they're usually very well written and well researched. Oh yeah, those are they're wonderful. Yeah. Um, and now, like fires, the level of disasters and such that you're like, that's not what has happened in California last year. Yeah. And just in the last summer, that's something that I think a lot of our local fire departments are starting to um, beef up with, with fire preparation. Um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, like, yeah, climate change issues are also weighing heavily on people like the Bainbridge and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, Katie. Okay. Um, so I love that this is comparing one area. Like, yeah. That's great. And I love being able to see it over time. But yeah. I think, I don't know, for me, it's like, it's sort of like our undergraduate students. I'm like, oh, those first two cases were way in the past. And, but in my mind, 1989 isn't that long ago. I know it's yeah, been yeah. years ago, but I remember watching it. Like, yeah. It's very vivid in my mind. So I wanted to hear a little bit more from you about what happens between 89 and the current day in terms of, I mean, the examples you were pulling from were like yeah. wildfires, et cetera, but, um, and you already spoke about, okay, social media comes into play, privatization yeah. of telecom comes into play. Yeah, yeah, 1996 telecommunications act. So, but. 9-11 is like, I mean, the 9-11 yeah. report so is. So I wanted to hear, like 9-11 report, Katrina, like what happened in between to get to this now? Okay. Um, so let's see, at the state level, the 1994 Northridge earthquake is also sort of very significant. And like, the, this is like the Northern California book. And maybe if I live long enough, I'll write the Southern California version of this book. Um, so Northridge is really important on a state level. Um, this happens in October, which, as you know, is probably off the top of your head, very close to the fall of the Berlin Wall. So we're basically seeing, like this is sort of like the last vestiges of Cold War era disaster planning, which really does envision 
like this sort of like white middle class nuclear family in a in a very sort of problematic way in its disaster planning. Um, so after um, Hurricane Andrew in 1992 the Northridge earthquake and you know the sort of fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of this sort of Cold War era of disaster planning. And then Bill Clinton comes into office and appoints this guy, DeWitt, I can't remember his first name. Um, and they're the ones who really start doing actually a lot of this community-based planning. So the community planning tradition comes out of civil defense in the Cold War. And it's sort of like all of these civil defense offices that have opened up around the US and done all of this kind of like local planning around um, nuclear disaster response don't really know what to do. And they sort of get swept up in some sense into more natural disaster planning. Um, and then once like FEMA gets established in 79, that falls away a little bit, that more community focus and really comes back during the Clinton era um, where there's sort of a much more local push to educate local disaster managers. Um, and then of course 9-11 is like this huge overhaul where FEMA gets subsumed into DHS. And so, um, so there's sort of like these different waves of FEMA's existence where FEMA or emergency offices are outside of um, whoever is worried about homeland security versus when they're inside. So once FEMA gets subsumed again into DHS, um, my sense is that they're um, these disaster plans sort of need to encompass terrorist attacks and all of these other types, um, you know, first person shooter events and all these other types of sort of events. Um, and some of the focus gets pulled away from, in California, for example, earthquake mitigation um, and some of that funding gets pulled away. Um, and so you have, uh, so the 9-11 the report and the Patriot Act and all of these sort of security oriented foci that follow um, I think um, show up very much in the response to Hurricane Katrina, which is sort of um, so catastrophic. Um, and you know, in, within the disaster studies community, there's this debate as whether Katrina was like so catastrophic, nobody could ever plan for it, or whether it really highlighted what a spectacular failure this whole enterprise has been. Um, and then so after Katrina, you see the rise. NIMS, I think, gets adopted on a national level maybe in 2007, although it's been in the works for a while. Um, so you see the rise of NIMS in this more centralized approach to um, how you're going to organize disaster response. But also during the Obama era, again, this like return to um, funding certs and more neighborhood programs and things like that. So that would be my like very, very high level outline of like that exactly stuff that's what happened. Yeah, that was exactly what I wanted. Just because it was like, yeah. like, wow, some big things must have happened. Yeah. Have you experienced? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and I sort of chose to write the book in a way that doesn't, it doesn't do the sort of broad sweep of history, but these like really close looks at information practices in these really specific moments. Um, but you sort of lose that, you know, the ability to talk in a lot of detail about the changes that happen in between. So, Nick. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm going to pick up on the same thread of, um, I love the comparative nature of a similar place across time. Yeah. I wonder if you could say maybe a little bit about how moving um, to potentially different destinations at the same time yeah. would impact your sort of theory and elaboration of event epistemologies. Yeah. Because we would think of epistemologies as being different to places, right? We would think of like a Western logics versus yeah. Eastern logics, et cetera. Yeah. So what might that do or like how would that shape your That's theory? That's like kind of my, that is more my, my next project is to sort of do a more um, regional look at that. I can say, let's see, my colleague Scott Miles and I ha, um, did a workshop recently um, called Seismic Cultures Around the Pacific Rim, where we were like sort of trying to get at some of these questions. I mean, obviously not everybody was as focused on the sort of epistemic issues as I was, um, but I think it certainly involves um, sort of like a robust theorizing about the different institutions involved in a sort of general enough way that you could look at it in different, say, national contexts or different regional contexts. Um, even thinking the difference between Washington State, Oregon, and California is actually like pretty interesting to think about today. So California, I mean, so it's frankly shocking for me to move here um, because it, 
to me, it was like, oh, we're moving to another place with seismic activity. Um, but there just isn't, wasn't, and I think M9 has actually done a lot to change this over the time that I've lived here, but um, there wasn't quite as a robust um, amount of like, information or sort of public knowledge about earthquakes when I moved here. So like, I remember talking to a realtor and being like, just don't show me a brick house. Um, I'm not gonna live in a brick house in a seismically active area. Um, because anyway, um, and so, she, you know, and she was like, what, why, why, you know, that seems ridiculous. So I think like you can even sort of think about um, the types of educational resources and institutions that are available. So in Northern California, you have USG, one of USGS's GS's hubs in Menlo Park, and they do a lot of public education there. Um, in Southern California, there's this institute called SCEC, um, Southern California Earthquakes Commission. Um, it's a big research organization that, um, so they're the people who started, um, they, they sort of did the first version of what's now Cascadia Rising up here. Um, they did, I don't remember what it was called, um, oh, the Great Shakeout in Southern California. Um, so they've been really innovative in their sort of like reaching out to the public. Um, and then up here, you know, uh, there's these interesting comparisons between Oregon and, um, and Washington and how they do disaster preparedness and management, for example, in like thinking about a magnitude nine earthquake and tsunami evacuation. Um, here, there's been more work to build vertical evacuation sites. Um, in Oregon, there's been sort of different approaches to considering tsunami evacuation. So um, I think it's, yeah, there's sort of a number of different ways that you can slice it and they're all really interesting. And yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, hey. Um, I'm currently doing a research project on seismic culture, um, looking at it from an ethnographic lens, trying to understand kind of what, where the uses of this word, what does it mean to the community who use it? The uses of seismic culture? That's interesting. It's, it's been incredibly interesting. because I who, who does use it? Um, I have a lit review, but... Um, I, so I've been looking... We thought that we made it up, actually. It's, it's funny, because I thought that I had as well. Yeah, which is kind yeah. of, I started finding more and more instances of this use. And yeah. your, the workshop that you guys did, you wrote the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And so that's one of the things. Yeah. But most, um, I've been finding it in relation to architecture. Yeah. So it's talked a lot about in a vernacular architecture yeah. space. Yeah. So yeah. I was just curious to hear you talk more about um, when you were talking about earthquake public. Yeah. Um, just what, how you define that and what that looks like and where that exists um, in the research that you've done. Yeah, so, um, so as I said, I was, I'm drawing on this concept of issue public. So I'm thinking, you know, publics are always political formations and there can sort of be no doubt that disasters are absolutely political projects and the sort of project of putting together a narrative and what narrative dominates about a disaster is you know, absolutely a pro sort of political problem. Um, so, I, and I will say I sort of differ from other folks in this space who have tried to use like crowd or something like that as a way of talking about groups of people um, who are, um, you know, talking about disasters and I'm like, well, I think we need like to be more explicit about the fact that in the, the ways we talk about disaster is, is political. Um, even calling it a disaster is, as I noted before, a sort of political thing. So I'm definitely drawing on um, uh, Maris as well and her, her sort of idea of material publics and that publics can be sort of knitted together um, around, you know, she has this idea that people are like turning on and off light switches or using eco home devices um, and that in being, you know, in these activities that makes them part of an issue public. Um, and so one of the arguments in my book is definitely, and I'm happy to like share my introduction, which is lots and lots more lit literature insights than what I'm saying right now. But um, yeah, so one of the ideas that I'm trying to um, argue for is that um, these public information infrastructures essentially sort of like bring these publics into being by, um, by their, their, they sort of produce publics um, by both their use and the sort of practices associated with their ongoing production. And again, I'm sort of drawing on this STS notion of infrastructures as being processes, not so much like things out there, if that makes sense. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about it. Thank <laughs> you.
technical pieces of that. Thank you so much for coming, Matt. Thank you very much. Yeah, take care. Have a great day. Any other questions? Yeah, hey, Leah. Hey, I have a question. The, the Verizon uh, throttling case yeah. puzzles me. Isn't it awful? Um, I, don't, I don't understand. I mean, the bad PR that they get from that seems to me like it would far outweigh any extra money that they get from the increased costs. I would agree. So what's going on there? Because I, like, compared to the, um, yeah. the uh, um, I forget if it was the first or the second case yeah. where the U.S. Postal Service was sending yeah. mail for free, right, 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 right on any paper. I mean, right. It seems like that seems like the right. the PR move to make. Yes, right? yes, I would agree with that. Um, I don't have a great answer for that, and I, I because that's like relatively recent. I, I don't I didn't write about it in my book, but um, but I'm working on a paper with another seismic culture researcher, Beth Reddy, who works in Mexico. Um, where we're sort of trying to work through like, yeah, the Paradise Fires and, and what happened at the back end of that. So I will have a good answer for that question, hopefully. Um, but I, I mean, what I imagine is that, so there's all these questions around like spectrum allocation and how spectrum is gonna be allocated for like emergency response and other things. And I wonder if it sort of fits into like that debate. And also this is all, all around, you know, net neutrality's repeal was also sort of happening around this time. So I'm like wondering if that has something to do with it. Um, so those are the questions that are in my mind, but I really don't have the answers. And then the other question I have, I didn't hear anything about um, shortwave radio. Does that come into play at all? Because I know there's a whole community out there yeah. whose house is involved in, <laughs> in it, who think of themselves as sort of yeah. disaster responders. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I mean, like, I, so I, when I was um, doing research for my dissertation, I spent some time hanging out with, like, hand, hand radio people in the East Bay in California and, like, you know, going to some of their demos where they're trying to, like, send messages as far as possible. And, yeah, they certainly see themselves as being, like, the people who are going to be able to communicate when everything else um, fails, um, which doesn't seem unreasonable. Um, but they didn't come into any of the yeah, stories that I was telling. Um, but yeah, no, they are like a very, very interesting group. I feel like, uh, I wonder if Christina Dunbar Hester has something to say about that because she's done all that stuff around like low power radio. Um, They're actually part of my Danish members community. Yeah, I bet. Some of the yeah. other community networks that are doing that, that's probably, that's one of the teams because they were divided to like medical team, vulnerable populations, yeah. and ham radio is part of the communications. And we actually plan with the assumption that we're, that we're not gonna have the yeah. towers for cell phone yeah. communication. We're making the assumption that there will be no way to communicate except for the old school way of running messages via bicycle and foot in yeah. ham radio and things like that. Yeah, so. but it'd be interesting to see like historically, how has that been used? Has it, I mean, is it, is it more, like, does it have to be such, uh, the disaster has to be so widespread? Yeah. That you yeah. don't need that form? Or yeah. It would be interesting to see what historically yeah. it, well, it has been used. That was another point I wanted to bring up in terms of, uh, we would, I mean, we could say that the advent of tech has changed dramatically with how information flow happens yeah. and how it becomes from out of the government hands to now more flat to uh, people to people spreading of information as yeah. opposed to back in the day when you didn't have the technology and yeah. you know, information was so slow to get from the east and west coast right but the thing is now what and one of the things that i wanted to bring up was a lot of these tech companies are are like their google x programs things that are not really of the public but they are doing a lot of research in terms of different ways to keep communication going in the event of dis uh, disasters to include things like uh, deploying these balloons to disaster areas right, to, right. to keep internet like mesh networks. Right. Yeah, no, there's a lot of research in this space, including by like lots of people on campus here. Um, I mean, one point I do want to make is I wouldn't, I, I don't necessarily like to think of things as like faster and slower. Like in, it, you know, I was trying to sort of make this point in 1868. Um, it wasn't necessarily that cross-country communication would have been faster. It's more like the bandwidth um, would have been quite different. Um, and the ability to access it for, um, for the general population would have been quite different. Um, but yeah, no, there's a ton of new interesting research going on around use of drones and balloons and mesh networks and other sorts of projects. Um, 
one thing I think that I, it's like, so I end up talking to a lot of student groups who want to like build these things. The one thing I try to underscore to them is that, yes, um, fortunate people like us will be adversely affected by a disaster. However, um, folks who live in um, extremely marginalized spaces, who live in poor housing, poor quality housing, or don't have housing at all, are going to suffer much, much, much more, and their problems aren't going to be ones of you know communication necessarily. They're going to be real, um, really sort of serious access to clean water and things like that. So, um, I. While I you know, find these sort of technology ideas really interesting, and it, it'll be interesting to see if and when they really get used um, on a grand scale, um, I also really worry that we, like, um, by sort of focusing on the problems of like, middle class people, that we're going to sort of further um, marginalize people who you know, already are going to have much, much, much harder time after these major events. So. I think that's one advantage of these community programs, though, because that's yeah. actually a specific team we have dedicated to vulnerable populations. Yeah, yeah, people absolutely. People who have physical disabilities or yes. fixed elderly. income, elderly, yeah. to be able to identify and to know who your neighbors are. Yes. And then even like housing, senior housing complex, we have teamed up with a condo association so that they're, they're paired up, so that their responsibility, once they make sure that they're okay, their neighbor's okay, that they go over mm -hmm. to this to help because they already know it's going to be challenged because the staff, the minimal staff, is no that's way right. able to take care of all that's the right. seniors. That's right, and they're not necessarily going to be able to make it in. Right. Yeah, and most of the research actually about these sort of community groups is that one of the sort of bi biggest benefits is that people actually get to know the people in their community by participating in it. So it's not even necessarily like um, things are going to go according to plan, um, but it's much more that you you know who to look for. Yeah, you know who to look for, and you know who's going to have trouble, um, and that those people are sort of visible in new ways. So yeah, that sounds really awesome. Yeah. And we're hoping that that model gets replicated to other, and I see it being replicated on other island communities, but I don't know how it is like in, in Seattle. But, but yeah. we've, done, we've done like um, conferences with Vashon Island. They have mm -hmm. a medical reserve corps that we interesting. Have, have met with them. So. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Um, you mentioned that there was a follow-up um, study that you were going to do after this. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, this, I mean, my response to Nick's question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I think I'm still sort of like conceptualizing what that's going to look like. So it'll probably be like a sort of many year affair. But I'm hoping to, yeah, think through some of what he was talking about, more comparative regional project. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you so much for being inside on a beautiful day.